Um, all right, so thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the Philly DSA Policy Committee's uh, presentation. We're presenting a, a paper that we've worked on for quite some time on Fair Work Week in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm going to drop in the chat uh, our summary of our paper, which is just a, like a two-pager um, for people to look over if they're not familiar. Um, I'll also in a second post a link to the full paper, but it's, it's like over 20 pages, so I wouldn't expect you to read it before this. Um, we're hoping to give sort of an overview of the paper um, and, and build some understanding of what we're proposing. Um, and then we're really looking forward to getting some feedback and answering some questions. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll sort of dive into the background for this a little bit. Um, I, my name's Jason Leach, I'm the chair of the policy committee. Um, and when the policy committee was formed, uh, our initial thought was that we were going to write some policy papers um, and put these forward to the membership as uh, the um, sort of the, the things that the chapter wants to undertake or get behind. The idea is sort of to come up with a, um, a platform for the chapter and the campaigns and the policies that we're most interested in as a chapter. Um, the, the one step in doing this is for us to, of course, write these papers. Uh, and then the next step is for us to present them to the membership to say, um, this is what we've come up with as a plank to the platform for the chapter, um, and then to get the feedback from the membership. Uh, the next step after this is most likely, if all things go well, uh, everything goes well, um, the policy committee will submit a resolution to the general membership to say, uh, do you or do you not endorse this paper? Um, and that's effectively saying we like this project, we like this campaign, we like this policy, and the whole force of the chapter stands behind it. Um, so I hope that's clear enough. That's a process stuff that I'm happy to talk about further. Um, but I also want to give some background to what we're about to talk about today. Um, so in December 2018, Philadelphia passed Fair Work Week legislation uh, just within the city. Um, it was a resounding success and it was a, a big coalition with uh, particular labor union locals in the city, um, particular community organizations and activist organizations, um, and as well as Philly DSA. Uh, we took a role in that. We worked with um, Councilmember Helen Gim on that legislation closely, um, and we did a lot of mobilization for it in late 2018. Um, so the next question after that uh, is what to do next. Um, right around the same time, Elizabeth Fiedler uh, finally won office. Um, she won her primary in 2018, won the general in 2018, and then took office in January 2019. And she went about also proposing Fair Work Week legislation, uh, but this time at the state level for the entire state. It looks a little bit different from the Philly legislation, and we'll talk about that. Um, but it's a nice expansion of what's already happening, happening in the city, expanding it across the state. Um, so she worked with coalition partners, including again, some labor unions and Philly DSA, um, and introduced a bill in May 2019 uh, that we'll just refer to as the Fair Work Week bill, Fair Work Week legislation, Fair Work Week PA, something along those lines. Um, currently, the bill sits in the Labor and Industry Committee uh, in the State House. Um, it, what, that was the first committee it went to, and it has sat there. This is a, just a reality of having a Republican-controlled legislature. Um, they can choose what comes up in committee and what leaves committee. Um, so right now it's stuck. Uh, our purpose here is to examine what Fair Work Week legislation would look like in Pennsylvania. Um, to look at this legislation put forward by Representative Fiedler and to try to figure out some ways to build some broader support around it uh, from the grassroots. Um, all right, so with that, um, I'll introduce uh, exactly who will be sort of presenting today and, and what we're presenting on. Um, so we have uh, two members of the policy committee, Robert Jackal and uh, Ben Davis. Um, and then a former member of the policy committee, Ben Swartz, who uh, worked significantly on this paper. Um, and I'm glad to have him back for this um, guest appearance. Uh, so Ben is gonna talk about the problem of a fair work week. So what's the problem of workers' schedules and how that works? Um, and then we're gonna talk about the, the principles of what we think fair work week legislation would look like. Um, the solutions that we're proposing. So you'll see in the summary, we have five principles and then five solutions that are sort of along those same lines. 
And these are things that we specifically want to see change in the Fair Work Week legislation. Um, and then uh, Ben Davis will take us into the Q&A where we really want to hear feedback from members about what they want to see in this paper, um, what they're not seeing in this paper, uh, what should change. Um, and it looks like Rob just posted in the chat the link to the specific legislation. If you'd like to look through that, you have particular questions. Um, but with all that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben Swartz to talk about the problem of scheduling for workers. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll try and briefly run over uh, sort of what we found from a ground up uh, perspective um, for anyone who's totally unfamiliar with this sort of thing. Um, uh, basically, in the broadest historical strokes, uh, we're at a time when service sector employment is the dominant form of employment in the American economy. And uh, if, you know, looking back at the historical trends, the offshoring of manufacturing jobs and often the dismantling of the unions that had been built up around those manufacturing jobs means that what we're left with is this predominantly uh, non-union and particularly exploitative uh, form of labor in the form of service sector work, which is also, you know, uh, despite being the dominant uh, form of labor in the American economy is still often viewed as a, a kind of necessarily low wage, um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear for teenagers type of occupation um, that consequently treats their workers as squeezable commodities. Uh, and so there is um, a robust sort of fight for 15 movement that deals with workers' incomes. Um, but I guess the, the sort of reason for this paper was uh, examining what's usually an under-discussed aspect of employment, and especially service sector employment, which is um, involuntary part-timing in general, uh, and in particular, unfair work weeks, um, which I'll sort of lay out in, in three specific uh, kind of prongs in what ways these schedules are unfair, but in general, uh, we're paying consideration to a worker's free time um, as something that is perhaps as consequential as however much money they make in the occupation. Um, so sort of diving right into the particulars of the problem, there's, a, a, I guess, a trend called just-in-time scheduling. Uh, which nowadays is often determined by apps and algorithms, uh, often by huge corporations that force workers to live by essentially the hour to hour dictates of consumer demand predictions. And the result is basically commercial operations staff at the precisely determined minimum and workers are left to deal with the consequences, which are often irregular and constantly changing shifts. Um, and I guess anecdotally, uh, I'll, I'll throw in that I was interested to work on this project um, at the beginning because I, despite being in a small business, was actually subjected to this myself. Um, and I got to see the app that was used. It was called Kronos, and it would spin out these variable changing shifts um, that included graveyard, and it was all based on the sort of uh, consumer income to uh, labor price ratio. Uh, and so that ratio determined basically everyone in the workplace's life um, and often just a week at a time to be as accurate about the consumer demands as possible. We would get the shortest window possible for getting these schedules. Um, and so just generally, I'm gonna talk about uh, the effects this has on people's income for one and you know, uh, non-income and sort of the kind of catch-all, everything else that's affected, which is everything from the maintenance of mental and physical health, uh, the provisioning of child or elder care, and various other uh, forms of personal development that might potentially even increase one's income if someone was not trapped in a sort of unfair work week situation. Um, so, going through the kind of findings, and this was more or less, um, there is a lot of good research we came across, so this is just sort of like a literature review in that sense. Um, what we found as far as income goes is that obviously people with these unpredictable schedules have higher income volatility, um, but the, the details are, are pretty striking. Um, so I guess first to get a sense of the scope, um, we have actually very good research coming out of 
Philadelphia um, through something called the Shift Project, uh, which examined service sector workers city by city. And so in Philadelphia, 34%, so roughly a third of service workers receive less than a week's notice of their schedule and 62% receive less than two weeks. So virtually everyone has less than two weeks uh, to plan their life and a significant chunk of them have less than one. And, you know, just 22% of people in the service sector in Philadelphia report having a regular daytime schedule, meaning a set you know, nine to five, and everyone else is trapped in variable shifts and rotating shifts. And the important point I wanna underscore up front is that this is largely involuntary. Um, and we can in fact demonstrate this from these uh, sort of publications like the Shift Project, uh, which found that 22% of service workers, um, so roughly a quarter, are getting fewer than 20 hours a week of work. And another quarter were just 20 to 30 hours and you know 35 percent are working between 30 and 40 but as you can see basically half are trapped under 30 hours and in fact 62 percent of workers service sector workers from the sample uh, and 74 percent of those working less than 30 hours a week reported that they actively want more hours so this is involuntary part-timing if i use that phrase later on is that these people want to be working more and have that extra income, but specifically do not have the power to decide their own schedule. And so in kind of the big picture, a lot of the reason we wanted to put this together and to put together a stronger fair work week uh, sort of package was to address this issue of worker power from a sort of socialist left perspective. How can we make a reform that hands power back to the workers when it comes to their free time? Um, so other important points to highlight, we uh, I talked a, a bit about the uh, you know, fight for 15 at the beginning. It's important to point out that service sector workers earn on average just 10.71 an hour. Um, and the living wage calculations for Philadelphia put it at 11.70 an hour for a single person with no children and 23.64 for a single parent with one child. And what I want to underscore is that these living wage estimates assume a full-time schedule, which, as I just detailed with the scope of this issue, is decidedly not the case for most people working in the city. Um, because 83%, uh, in fact, work less than full-time hours. So we felt that the sort of discourse surrounding minimum wage, minimum wage uh, was leaving this out. Um, now, onto the income volatility itself. Uh, one third of households across the US report income variation from month to month. Uh, and the single most cited cause is a regular work schedule. And breaking the country into income quintiles, the bottom 20%, 74% of those households experience income fluctuations of 30% or more month to month. Um, so these are huge swings in very small incomes that you know, uh, I, I think when broken down, uh, translate into people making 2,000, say, a month, 30% of that is going to be the difference between paying a bill and not paying a bill. And in fact, when they went in, the shift project went in and asked workers about this, of service workers, 65% reported experiencing at least one serious material hardship, and 54% reported that they would probably or definitely not be able to cope with an emergency expense of just $400. Um, and all of this, by the way, is uh, pre-coronavirus, um, that all of this research was collected and we collated this. Um, so on top of this, on top of these highly volatile incomes for the lowest possible earners, um, there's the fact that a lot of our social programs, as I'm sure all of us are aware, are heavily means tested, not just based on income, but by one's employment status whatsoever. So these social programs are specifically not responsive to the weekly and monthly fluctuations that these low income earners are experiencing. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of the problem with income, but I do also wanna talk, uh, speak on the sort of qualitative effects of the scheduling. Um, there is research on sleep and happiness in particular. 
Um, and it was found that shift cancellation, working on call and working the clopening shift, if anyone's actually done it, 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 basically the last out first in scheduling approach for people directly correlates with negative sleep outcomes and sleep quality. And beyond that, uh, nearly half of service sector workers uh, reported more than a little psychological distress and nearly a third reported being unhappy. Um, and again, this correlates directly with the irregularity of their schedule. Um, now, moving beyond the individual, uh, family effects, irregular and on-call shift employees in particular actually experienced double the work-family conflict compared to their regular shift counterparts, according to these surveys. And among hourly workers, nearly three quarters of young adults, uh, categorized as 26 to 32, report work hours that fluctuate monthly. And this is the same group that is most likely to have young children at home. Um, so quite apart from uh, the, the fact that daycares and, and services that are similar often work on a standard schedule. Um, in addition to this, they found correlations between these non-standard variable shifts and lower teacher reported school performance, as well as higher levels of externalizing behavior problems. Um, so children are actually bearing a, a lot of the consequences of these irregular schedules, not just uh, through not being able to go to a daycare program during the day, but also actively um, through that under socialization um, perform worse in schools and social settings. Um, now, you know, big picture, um, there is also an effect on, uh, harder to quantify, but the fact that fluctuating variable hours discourage people from enrolling in paid courses, um, say like online college degrees or uh, online skills trainings and the like that could possibly get them uh, out of service sector employment and endure a different job, they're going to be much more hesitant to even enroll in those from the beginning if they don't know even what their next week is going to look like. Um, and in a similar vein, I think most catastrophically and something I again have like direct experience with necessitating open availability for these service workers which is increasingly becoming the industry norm specifically means that they are unable to take on a second job so if they're necessarily keeping their whole schedule open for a few shifts that are as we discussed more than likely going to be sub 30 hours at sub 15 an hour they're actively unable to seek further employment elsewhere. Um, so I guess kind of tying it all together, uh, I, what I hope is clear is that just like there is a, a sort of cycle of poverty as it relates to income, these effects are cyclical because the more demanding a schedule, uh, the less likely a worker is to achieve these various outside of work personal development goals that might help them get out of the service industry. Um, but from kind of the left perspective, I think the last thing I want to emphasize is that we're not looking to, you know, give these people skills programs that work on variable schedules. Like ultimately, our goal should be making the service sector something that is livable. Um, and that means we'll have to tackle the question of unfair scheduling. Um, and so the, the last thing I'll say um, is that we conceptually grouped all of the problems I talked about into kind of three main tents. Uh, which we termed insufficiency. Um, so that is just the involuntary part-timing. I talked about working fewer hours than is sufficient to pay the bills. Um, unpredictability, um, which like what it sounds like is having only a few days notice of the schedule you're gonna have that week or that month, um, as well as the last minute call-ins, um, which are frequently plaguing uh, you know, workers in the restaurant industry being called in the night before a shift uh, and perhaps even sent home from a shift if there's not enough demand. Uh, and finally, variability, which refers to just the changing time and duration and sometimes location of a worker's shift from week to week, which means they're less and less able to do things like have a standard daycare schedule, a standard elder care schedule, uh, et cetera. So uh, yeah, all told, those are the income and non-income problems we're dealing with uh, as as well as the various categorizations of insufficiency, unpredictability, and variability.
So with that, I'll pass it off to the overview of our principles when we're working out the solution. Thanks, Ben. Um, that was helpful. Um, I also forgot to mention, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat while one of us is speaking, and um, we can keep track of those and make sure they get covered uh, during the Q&A. So there's no need to, to hold off if you have a question while someone's speaking. Um, just throw it in the chat. All right. Um, I am going to talk about our five principles that we are proposing. Um, and for that, I'm going to share my screen if that will work out. Okay. Um, so uh, you should be able to see this is the, um, the draft paper. This is the full paper, all uh, 27 pages of it. Um, and I'm going to walk through what the, what the five principles are that we're proposing. Um, so the first two are regards, uh, have work with regards to scope. They're about sort of universalizing this policy, right? Um, so Ben just talked a lot about very, um, you know, a, a wide range of situations and a wide range of problems. Um, that can affect all sorts of workers. Um, so the first principle that we're going to talk about is universal coverage for wage workers. Uh, what this means is that um, part-time, full-time, temporary, and seasonal workers uh, would be covered by any piece of legislation that we're proposing Philly DSA would want to see. Um, so we're recommending um, or really demanding that part-time, full-time, temporary, and seasonal workers uh, be included. Another way of phrasing this is any hourly worker or any non-exempt worker, right? Um, we're focusing on folks who have to work by a certain schedule given to the boss. Um, and that's what we're talking about here is um, non-exempt employees or, or hourly uh, wage worker employees. Um, I also want to just quickly flag how the independent contractor fits into this. Um, based on our assessment of um, Pennsylvania law and the way the bill um, Representative Fiedler's bill is currently written. Uh, we're not including independent contractors here, um, but we are advocating that uh, if a complaint comes from an independent contractor, uh, it's on the burden of proof uh, for determining that someone's an independent contractor is on the employer. Uh, so this sort of brings up further questions about whether that worker should actually be categorized as an hourly wage worker, a more traditional worker, rather than an independent contractor. Um, so that's the that's the language we're taking on, um, and I think uh, it's a it's a way to sort of get around this question. There was also recently some um, a court decision, I think, by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court regarding independent contractors. Um, I think we we need to think through exactly how that fits in, but this at least allows some some room to argue that maybe independent contractors should be included. Um, the next principle I want to I want to go to is also about scope. This is about industries and employers. Um, so universalizing to say all wage workers are included. We also want to universalize um, to say that uh, all employers should be considered covered employers. That's the the language we would use in legislation. Um, so what we're talking about, of course, is a problem that can occur in any sort of industry. Um, the major ones, the super visible ones, include food service and hospitality and retail. Um, those we understand, but there are other industries where this is certainly a problem as well. Um, you can think of healthcare, you can think of K-12 education, um, you can think of agriculture. These are all situations where hourly wage workers um, are again, just like any other worker, subject to the schedules set by their bosses. Um, so we think that there should not be a carve out for other industries, that we should be talking about all industries. Um, it's also common in Fair Work Week legislation uh, to look at employers of a particular size. So a lot of Fair Work Week legislation from around the country is focused on uh, very large employers, you know, big ones like Walmart, McDonald's, um, Marriott, uh, some of the major players within uh, the, the service sector. Um, but we're, we're recommending that, again, we think about this more universally um, and understand that a lot of workers, even at smaller employers, are subject to just the same power dynamics. Um, you can think of someone who works at a dive bar in Philadelphia, right? The way that their schedule is set is often not that different from the way it would be set if they were working um, at, let's say, like a, a restaurant chain, like a TGI Fridays. Um, TGI Fridays might be more sophisticated in the technology they use, but the power dynamic is exactly the same. 
Um, the boss can demand that they, they come in at a certain time, um, that they work back-to-back -back shifts, uh, that they have no say over, over where they work if there are multiple locations, right? Um, so we're suggesting, again, to universalize both cover all workers and cover all employers. Um, the third uh, principle that I wanna cover is worker control over worked hours. Um, so again, this is taking more of a, a left socialist perspective on the issue. Um, we're saying that uh, a, a worker's hours are, of course, some in some cases dominated by the boss. They choose how we, we act when we're working and choose what we do while we're working. Uh, we'd like to chip away at that dynamic and hopefully get to more worker control. In this case, worker control over what hours they make. So this is our, our ideal. This is something that we would like um, society to get to. Um, and we think that there's opportunity here for certain language, for certain pieces of the legislation to really get to this idea of worker control. Um, one way I think that we can think about this is a lot of legislation, including Fair Work Week legislation, uh, discourages the bad behavior of employers. Uh, it'll say that if an employer does this to an employee, then they get fined. If they do this, then they're liable to a lawsuit, right? Lots of language to discourage employers from doing things. Um, that's all well and good, but I, I at least personally would argue that's insufficient, um, that we need to be thinking more about giving power to workers, giving them some agency in the workplace um, so that they can determine their own shifts. Um, and the way that we see this play out, and, and we'll get to this uh, in a few minutes um, when we talk about our solutions, um, one of the ways we see this play out is advance notice for work schedules. So this is coming to an agreement between the um, employer and the worker about how much notice they get for their schedule. So they have to write a schedule, you know, X number of days, X number of weeks uh, before that schedule comes up. Um, another sort of agreement that the two need to reach, both the employer and the worker, is a binding work schedule uh, when, the, when the worker comes on, on board uh, to the firm. So this is another instance where workers can have some control in the negotiation with their boss over when they'll be working. Um, and then again, something else that we think helps to get at this idea of worker control is predictability pay. Um, so Ben is going to explain this a lot more, which I think will be helpful, but the basic idea is that if your hours get cut for some reason or changed, uh, that in increases unpredictability in your life, and you should be compensated uh, for that unpredictability. Um, you should be given some sort of pay as if you worked the hours that you were promised, or extra pay because you were forced to come in um, hour, during hours that you didn't expect uh, to be working. All right, uh, the fourth principle is uh, expanded legal rights. Um, so here we're talking about uh, mostly about enforcement and about liability um, and who has uh, the right to sue in a civil court. Um, so enforcement would come from an agency. Uh, we're going to talk a little more specifically about what this looks like, but um, making sure that whatever agency is taking on Fair Work Week legislation in Pennsylvania has uh, reliable enforcement mechanisms in place uh, so that they can demand more of employers um, when, when they uh, do things to mess with workers' schedules. Um, additionally, we're going to give, uh, Rob will, will explain this more, but we're going to give some uh, room to workers or to the agency to sue employers, uh, so they'll have a right to action. Um, and this is, again, to expand a worker's ability, ability to control uh, what they do in the workplace through specific legal means, the, the tools in front of them in the court. Um, lastly, uh, we want to talk about a, a very common topic, topic in Pennsylvania, which is preemption. So um, a lot of legislation that comes out of Harrisburg, especially with the Republican-controlled legislature, is to preempt what counties and municipalities can do, um, what, they, what sort of legislation they can put forward. A classic example of this is uh, minimum wage in the state. Is, uh, there's, of course, a federal minimum. Pre there's a... Um, uh, a minimum wage set at the state level, which it, for now is exactly the same as the, the federal level. Um, and then there's an additional clause to say that uh, no county or municipality can have a higher minimum wage uh, than what is currently set by the state. And this is called preemption. The state is preempting counties and municipalities from doing something uh, in addition to what the state is legislating. 
Um, so we're saying that for this particular topic, Fair Work Week, um, we should see nothing. We should see no language about uh, preemption. In fact, we should see language um, that allows counties and municipalities to treat this legislation as a floor, and not as a ceiling. To say that this legislation is the, the minimum requirement for workers in the state, um, and that counties and municipalities should feel free to introduce stronger legislation, but it cannot undercut uh, what is being made available to workers through this legislation. Um, so that's the no preemption. Uh, principle. Um, all right, so again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A. Um, but next I'm going to go back to Ben Swartz for the solutions. Sure. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll be covering the first three solutions, um, which are, uh, I think, uh, basically the three more uh, technical ones um, and have the most to do with the actual bill that was passed in Philadelphia. Um, and so you'll be hearing a lot of specific numbers and, and references, which are in a large part drawn from the framework of the Fairer Work Week bill that exists in Philadelphia. But a lot of this is also more or less pieced together just from ideas about how to, uh, again, from a left perspective, hand power to workers as much as possible within this framework. Uh, and also pieced together from uh, good examples, um, which often come from collective bargaining agreements uh, and things unions have won uh, with their collective power for workers. Um, so just starting off, uh, the first is pretty much the simplest, which is advance notice of one month, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you know, uh, it was upwards of 90% of service workers had less than two weeks notice. Um, so the idea behind this is to one, obviously just give workers the full month at a time block of what their schedule can look like. Um, and the rationale is more or less that the major expenses that workers are running into from rent and utilities and perhaps a lot of the you know services like child and elder care are billed monthly. Um, and the income volatility problem being what it is, we thought the best possible patch uh, to this would simply to allow workers to have in advance the schedule for the month so they will know exactly how much they're making that month. Um, and as far as the alterations to the schedule that might happen within that month, um, we'll cover this in the proceeding too. Um, but again, let me know if anyone has questions as I go through each one. Um, or any of the specifics or what our rationale is or even just notes you have about personal experience or ways to improve it. So again, starting off with a full week's notice or rather full month's notice of the work schedule, um, we then came up with the binding work schedule estimate and guaranteed minimum hours. Um, so starting with the work schedule estimate, um, what we mean by this, and this is again modeled off the Fair Work Week legislation that exists in Philadelphia um, is to propose at the very outset of employment a work schedule estimate that the employer gives to the employee, which is binding and which includes a guaranteed minimum of hours, which I'll talk about shortly. But by work schedule estimate, what it would essentially entail is a detailing of what shifts uh, an employee can expect you know, what their general variability is, what the, um, you know, locations and durations are going to be um, for, you know, let's say a, a given six months of employment um, and, you know, basically the boundaries of what the variation will be. Um, now, our significant uh, sort of a, a contribution to this is uh, that we actually define what a significant change to this estimate entails because the Fair Work Week legislation in Philly um, and pretty much everywhere often has penalties act on and, and language surrounding significant changes to an initial estimate, but this is legislatively undefined and thus entirely toothless. Um, and so these verbal contracts, which uh, are in practice never respected, would in this iteration actually be a concrete document that spells out what the employee can expect and a significant change to it would 
be fully defined in the law. Um, so going a little further, um, you know, a significant change uh, either to the overall estimate of what the worker can expect in the long term or in the short term would both constitute a violation and give them predictability pay, the employee predictability pay, which I'll uh, get into with the third point. Um, but also, uh, as I said, this work schedule estimate will, under our platform, crucially include a guaranteed minimum of hours. Uh, and this is specifically to combat the involuntary part-timing nature that often happens over the course of a job. Uh, and again, this is something I've experienced directly even the, over the course of writing this was I came on as a full-time employee and saw hours whittled down to 35, which aren't enough for a second job, but aren't, you know, sort of sufficient to pay the bills, especially if this is, you know, a, a month to month, uh, you make rent or don't make it based on these hours. So the way we eliminate that, uh, and this is actually um, an idea I believe we pulled from uh, Costco's uh, uh, agreements with his employees, is there is a guaranteed minimum that no part-time worker will fall below. Um, and you know, you can say that's 25, you can say that's uh, 30, um, and that may well depend on what the worker has in mind. Perhaps someone wants a second job. Uh, and so the whole idea behind this is to give a little modicum of control at the outset of employment, for an employer to say, this is what I generally want my schedule to look like. These are the hours that I cannot have any less than. Um, and the idea would be, of course, uh, they're still exploited by the boss, but at the very least, the boss cannot transgress over these basic boundaries of how many hours they get and what those hours typically look like. Um, so again, that is the work schedule estimate with the guaranteed minimum. And the third point is, uh, as we've made reference to several times, predictability pay. Um, and the idea behind this is that rather than these violations being treated with fines levied by the agency and collected by the state, every violation of an employer employee's uh, work schedule estimate um, or even just weekly schedule would constitute a violation that gets paid out directly to that employee. So basically these people who are experiencing the most income volatility and need the income the most are gonna be the ones that benefit from any unexpected call-in, any last minute shift change, or any long-term change to what their work life looks like. Um, so you know, we again lifted from a, a lot of union agreements, the idea of time and a half, um, so your wage plus 50% um, for being called in unexpectedly. Um, and we also have a, a, a minimum of two hours pay for on-call shifts, even if you don't get called in. So you are setting aside that time for a potential shift rather than getting if the shift comes and goes and you're not called in, no income at all, you at least have some pay for being asked to wait by the phone. Um, we would also expand predictability pay, and this goes sort of far above the scope of the uh, uh, Fair Work Week legislation in Philadelphia. We would expand this predictability pay to cover violations of that work schedule estimate we talked about. Um, and getting into the details, basically workers would receive 20 hours of pay at the regular rate for any sort of deep alteration to this long-term work schedule estimate. So they're getting, you know, uh, basically uh, half a week's wages for any long-term change that the boss decides to foist upon them and eight hours of pay at the regular rate for each significant change made in any six week window. Um, so if you, in the middle of this month, change someone's shifts around, you have to pay them for a full day's work for that inconvenience. Um, and lastly, and I think most importantly, uh, what we lay out in the platform is that a failure to meet the guaranteed minimum hour, uh, hourly uh, sort of set up for any employee would constitute a violation where you award them predictability pay equal to the hours missed. So if you were promised 25 hours of work, you were getting 25 hours of pay even if they don't need you and even if they don't prefer you in the establishment itself. Um, so those are the first three changes and I will pass it off there. All right, uh, thanks Ben. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, solution number four, which is an expanded scope. Um, so again, we talked about universality under the principles, right? 
um, Ben was just talking about the principle of worker control for the most part. I'm going to talk about um, one of the pieces of, of universality, which is the, the scope of which cover which employers are covered under the legislation. Um, so what we're what we're proposing um, as a change to Representative Fiedler's bill um, is that it cover more employers. It say that it demand of more employers um, that they uh, set up these negotiations with um, their workers and, and take on this Fair Work Week legislation. Be subject to this Fair Work Week legislation is uh, the best way to put it. Um, so uh, the bill, Representative Fiedler's bill, HB 40, 1436, as it's currently written, um, defines the particular industries as well as particular sizes of employers. Um, so one, it defines retail, hospitality, and food services firms. Um, so we're focusing mostly on the service sector where we know there's a lot of part-time work um, and a lot of involuntary uh, underemployment. Um, and it also focuses on very large employers. So the scope that we're talking about here is firms that have 250 or more employees, uh, regardless of where the employees work. And, um, 20 or more locations, again, regardless of where those locations are. So these are, these are large firms with 250 or more employees and 20 or more locations, either within Pennsylvania or across um, the country. So uh, this also includes chains and franchises. Uh, this is an important thing to know. Um, but what we're talking about with this section, uh, when we're talking about the size of the employer, um, are again, some of your very large firms. Uh, so 250 or more employees obviously puts Walmart, McDonald's, uh, TGI Fridays, um, a lot of the, the big name uh, retail, hospitality and food service firms, um, but it does not include some of your smaller employers. Um, so again, I'll use the example of the, the dive bar around the corner in Philadelphia, um, definitely does not have 200 or 250 or more employees and does not have 20 or more locations. Um, so what we're suggesting uh, as a change to Representative Fiedler's bill uh, is to change how she's defining a covered employer. Um, so this is changing the definition in the bill of a covered employer um, to under, under our language um, so that there, uh, there's no focus on particular industries or put another way, there's no carve out for all other industries uh, besides um, retail, hospitality, and food services, um, and that there's no carve out for smaller firms, for small businesses. Um, and we take, uh, we take some particular language specifically from San Jose's uh, municipal ordinance, um, which is one of these Fair Work Week legislations that's been going around the country. Um, San Jose uses some interesting, um, uses an interesting framework for this where they uh, they define a covered employer as any firm that pays corporate taxes in the state um, or uh, is, um, oh, I lost the language here, um, or is an S corporation. Uh, so what we're advocating for the, for the Pennsylvania legislation is for, um, is to change this definition of covered employer to uh, an employer who is subject to um, taxes in the state of Pennsylvania or is a corporation that uh, is exempt from state taxes. So we're still defining them as a corporation, but we're also covering those who are exempt um, or is an S corporation, which is a, a particular type of, of way that you can incorporate that often allows you to get, ha get around certain types of laws. Um, but if you have, if you are employing workers uh, who are non-exempt or are subject to an hourly wage, even if you're an S corporation, under our definition, you would be subject um, to this legislation. And then the last thing I'll note is we're also including, uh, as a covered employer, all public employers uh, as they're defined in, in an existing uh, statute about public employee relations. Um, so this is this is much more expansive. We're talking um, about a about changes in a number of ways, right? So we're expanding to all industries. Um, by basically no longer specifying particular industries. We're expanding to all sizes of firms, again, by no longer specifying um, particular sizes of firms, uh, like the, the current bill does. 
Um, and we're also expanding to private and public firms um, and to firms that pay taxes or don't um, and to firms that are small or large. Um, so this is a, a major change away from what Representative Fiedler is proposing in her bill, um, but I'll just, um, I'll give some justification for it. So again, San Jose has some similar language in their municipal ordinance. Um, similar Fair Work Week legislation passed in Vermont also has some of this expanded scope. They, um, they do not uh, carve out particular industries. Um, additionally, a couple of Pennsylvania uh, labor laws, things that are very uh, important to Pennsylvania law, such as the wage payment and collection law and the equal pay law, both of which have been on the books for years, um, they similarly do not make these carve outs for particular industries or employers of particular sizes. They apply sort of cart, um, across the board to all sorts of employers. Um, we can also look to some uh, federal legislation like the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, they're tasked with uh, looking at equal opportunities um, for, for employment. So this is largely employment discrimination. Um, and they only offer exemptions by size on 15 or fewer employees. So again, there's a very small carve out, much smaller um, than, than what is in the current bill. Um, and we would be open to even this, this sort of language. It's, it's proof that the, the carve out that um, is in the current bill is, is much too large. Um, the last thing I'll note uh, just briefly is that when she was running for president, Senator Elizabeth Warren, um, who certainly had her own deficiencies in her platform. Um, she was proposing Fair Work Week legislation in her platform, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, and she, again, was taking this idea of 15 employees as exists in federal legislation and was only giving a carve out for uh, businesses that have 15 or fewer employees. Um, so this is, again, much more expansive than what is being proposed in the state legislature. Um, and we think that we, we could go um, much further to, to include all employees. All right, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Ron. Hi. So the last piece I'm gonna talk about is the question of legal rights because, and specifically enforcement, because you can have any um, paper rights, but unless there's an enforcement mechanism, they're ultimately toothless. Um, so the Pennsylvania bill as written has relatively strong but Pennsylvania in general has relatively strong statutes for workplace place protections. So a lot of what we did for this was lifted from the Pennsylvania wage payment and collection law, uh, partially because it was, it has some strong language, but also to maintain some consistency in the law. Um, and just as with the wage payment collection law, there we would have multiple avenues for uh, legal recourse. The first would be, um, to file a complaint with, it's the, the BLLC, which is the, sorry, the, um, it's within the department, it's the Bureau of Labor Law Compliance. And essentially what you do is you file a complaint with them. And to give an example, the wage complaint form looks like this. Uh, so that would be the first avenue to then have regulatory enforcement where the agency would then pursue it. Um, one problem with this though is that agencies can easily be defunded and especially if we're creating a lot of new cases for the agency to enforce and there isn't an additional funding mechanism or there's a governor who comes in who's hostile you need to have alternative approaches so uh one would be as with the wage uh payment and collection law you have private lawsuits so if people think there's an issue they can go and they can sue and get what usually referred to as triple damages um, there's a, there's a damages calculation or a penalty calculation within the um, Fiedler bill. And there could be something similar to this with suitable attorney's fees such that people actually take the cases. Um, and again, the main reason to do this is to ensure that any hostile governor or hostile agency doesn't simply uh, kill this through neglect. Um, and also there are criminal penalties in the existing wage payment and collection law, which it seems aren't enforced much, but yes, it turns out Pennsylvania, um, you can get criminal fines and even jail time. So we're encouraging uh, any future bill to have that 
kind of enforcement mechanism as well. Um, finally, with that, we looked at a, um, a devolution of power because Again, if you have a state government that isn't necessarily interested in pursuing this, maybe won't, a lot won't happen. But if you also have local DAs and city solicitor's offices and give them the power to prosecute these cases, um, there's yet another avenue for enforcement. Um, the other thing to, 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 that we included in this section was to make sure that this is not um, a right that's waivable through contract or something that can easily be sent to arbitration. Um, it's very often people sign contracts with their employers, they have huge releases of liability. So this, this would be something that cannot be um, waived when you sign your contract with your employer. The exception that the Fiedler bill has to this um, is for collective bargaining agreements. Uh, I think the idea is that if your union is, is creating an alternative arbitration system, it's because it will be stronger or more tailored to their needs in the existing law. But other than, than that, there would be no waiver. That's it. Um, all right, thanks, Rob. Um, so I think that concludes uh, our, our presenting. Um, so again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat, but we're also gonna open it up. This is a general uh, Q&A section. So just uh, chime in with your questions and Ben Davis will sort of filter uh, them through. Okay, does anybody have any questions? So, uh, great. That was a compliment, not a question. So there's no, I don't hear any <laughs> questions from the group, no. Okay. <laughs> I, guess, I guess everybody liked the presentation. All right, well, if there's no questions, I'm gonna pass it back to Jason. Oh, we have one question from Vicki. I guess she's typing. Um, Vicki, you can feel free to just speak if you'd like. Yeah, sorry. I might have missed this at the beginning because um, I joined kind of late, but is there any way that anything like Fair Work Week could be passed at the federal level? Or does it have to be state by state? Do you mean from like a, a politics perspective or a legal perspective? A legal perspective. No, I think it could be passed at the federal level. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can discuss the politics perspective, which I, you know, would assume is grim. <laughs> Uh, I actually had a question, um, and I'm not for her to target this to, about the politics perspective in Pennsylvania specifically, which is that what makes this law more likely to pass with the changes that we're suggesting? Is that, the, is that the purpose of making these changes, or are we changing it just because we want the, the changes we want to say? Um, that's a great question. So I, I can try to answer that. Um, I think the, the politics, at least my personal reading of the politics, um, is that as long as the Pennsylvania legislature, as long as at least one chamber of the Pennsylvania legislature is controlled by Republicans, uh, this is very unlikely to pass. This, to me, this is just a fruit uh, issue of partisanship in the state, um, and particularly of how far right Pennsylvania Republicans are. Um, in Harrisburg. So is there, any, is there I, any possibility of a of the Democrats controlling both houses? Yes. Okay. Depends on whether vote by mail gets counted. Okay. But yes. Yeah, I think personally for me in the interim while we wait for that to happen, um, there's some political advantage to 
introducing a more robust, more worker-friendly bill um, as a way to distinguish which Democrats are willing to take a stand on this issue. Um, Fiedler has impressively uh, gotten a lot of co-sponsors from the Democratic caucus for this bill, uh, which I, I don't want to understate how valuable and impressive that is. Um, but I think there's some opportunity to help differentiate some of those Democrats, at least as we wait for um, Democrats to take control of both chambers. Um, there's an opportunity to differentiate which Democrats are willing to stand up for a very pro-worker piece of legislation that should um, at least conceptually get a lot of support from labor unions across the state. Um, and while we, while we wait for the opportunity to actually pass it, I think it's good to come out with a strong messaging bill. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. So if there's no further questions, I'm going to pass it back to, uh, to our hosts. I guess, uh, Jason, if you'd like to conclude. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll give it just one last minute to see if there are any other questions, but um, I'll say that uh, the policy committee has worked uh, quite some time on this project, um, and I, I hope we, it shows how much thought we've given to it. Um, the next steps for us are, of course, we need to take in whatever feedback we get coming out of this meeting um, and look for some more uh, edits that we might want to make to the paper. Um, then we will be sort of like bringing the paper and a, an accompanying resolution to uh, the next general meeting for the chapter um, to say this is a, a plank of our platform uh, that we'd like to put forward um, as a chapter and get the full force of the membership behind. Um, so if there are no questions, if we, if we don't have any major edits to make to this paper, I think pretty soon uh, our membership should be saying uh, more from the policy committee uh, to try to get this, uh, get the full endorsement of the chapter um, behind these ideas. Um, so you can, you can look forward to that. Um, I still don't see any questions, which I guess is, uh, is good news. Um, so I'm going to take a second to uh, post the sign in one more time in uh, the chat. Um, so if you can take a minute just to, to sign in um, so we can look at how many people attended um, and contact you if we have any additional materials. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it. Thank you very much to uh, Ben, Ben, and Rob for, for presenting and giving lots of information. Um, and thanks to all of you for attending. I know this can be dry, but I hope it was interesting.